I'm just going to briefly discuss ionophore diagnostics, um, not specific necessarily to Narison, but what um, at the diagnostic labs we would be walking through and you in the field potentially would be walking through as well and hopefully give you some um, practical advice on samples to collect um, and things like that. So with that, um, again, we'll walk through the criteria we need to fulfill in order to, to come to the toxicity diagnosis, um, the expected lesions that you would see out on the farm and what we would see underneath the microscope, as well as the diagnostic samples and the appropriate testing um, on those samples that you would, would pull. Um, so the, the criteria that need to be fulfilled with ionophore toxicity would be um, appropriate clinical signs in groups of pigs. This isn't a, a really an individual animal disease problem. This is something that's feed related, so you should be seeing, um, like Dr. Robbins said, up, up to 20% were affected, but in some areas it was potentially 8%. Um, you'd want to have the appropriate um, gross, so necropsy findings as well as the histopathology to back up the, 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 the findings that we would expect. And then you need to demonstrate ionophores in the feed, um, either at a toxic level, which varies between ionophores, or potentially just demonstrate the presence of ionophores with um, a potentiator, which um, was kind of touched on as well, but I'll bring up again. So tiamulin is known um, for that particular um, problem. And then you need to exclude other differential diagnoses. So expected gross lesions, what you might see when you're posting a pig, often you're not going to see anything. Um, if you're going to see something, what you would expect to see um, would be so in this image here, what is depicted is um, small white foci. These are areas of necrosis within the skeletal muscle. Um, and then in these sections over here, which again is not projecting very well, um, there are small red foci, which are indicative of hemorrhage within the skeletal muscle. Um, this often isn't present, but if you see it, that's um, what, you're, what you're looking at. Um, and these images, this image here is um, kind of representing what you potentially may see in the urinary bladder so area. So on the left here is kind of a reddish brown urine. Um, I apologize, I don't have myoglobin from a pig, so this is horse urine. So it's a little bit milkier than you would expect, but again, it's a kind of a red brown. And then on the left, this is hemoglobin area, which would be a differential diagnosis you should have if you have a kind of a colored urine. Um, I didn't put on um, a, an example of hematuria, which would be bleeding into the urine. That, again, that's not really a, a, an individual pig problem. This is something that you're looking at if you have um, pens that are having issues. If you are posting a case or were posting a case, which is kind of a subacute to chronic phase, we would see some different um, potentially gross lesions. Again, often are absent, but because um, skeletal muscle may not regrow or um, regenerate as we would expect, sometimes you can end up with kind of firm fibrotic muscles, which may be a little harder cutting than you expect. But another finding, um, which occasionally will we'll show up, this picture is depicting um, mineralization, so this white material here is kind of gritty and maybe slightly raised if you were to drag your, your hand across that, and that's mineralization in degenerate muscle fibers. So um, the body's response to um, degenerate fibers is to deposit calcium and phosphorus, and so you get this white kind of granular material. What do we see on histopathology as, as a pathologist or a resident in my case? Um, the predominant feature in ionophore toxicity is skeletal muscle necrosis. It's been reported in spontaneous cases that you may also see um, uh, myocardial necrosis. In many of the experimental reproduced, uh, experimentally reproduced disease, um, the, the heart necrosis is not as prominent as, say, in a horse. A horse would potentially have the only sign would be um, cardiac muscle necrosis. So this is a little bit different. Pigs um, often don't show any heart, and if they do, it sometimes is regional. Um, what we also may see is, is some changes in the kidney associated with the, um, the myoglobin in the urine. So this image right here is, is depicting a degenerate and necrotic myofiber. So again, it's segmental. This is normal here. These are all normal around it. Um, but this skeletal muscle fiber right here, the normal um, sarcomeres and the kind of orderly structure of the muscle has been replaced by just kind of amorphous eosinophilic material, which is all necrotic myofibers. If we get a pig in that's potentially maybe three, four, six, seven days out, um, we do see some different changes. We don't necessarily see as much of that acute changes, um, but we will see macrophages coming in to clean up the dead tissue. Again, this isn't a, a myositis, but this is, is a response to try to, to clear that. Um, and if everything is going well, 
we would hope to see some regenerative myofibers. So muscle is, is very rapid in its response. Um, if it's insulted, it has two options. It can either regrow, so if the, if the um, column, kind of the sarcolemmal membrane is intact surrounding a muscle, muscle fiber, it will regrow from the satellite cells on the outside. Um, but if that's disrupted at all, you'll get fibrosis and potentially some um, abnormal looking muscle fibers. Um, occasionally you will see mineralization. Um, these pigs, there wasn't, a, a, that Dr. Robbins had talked about, there wasn't much as far as fibrosis. So this image is depicting um, skeletal muscle fiber. This is a cross section. Um, and so what we're seeing here is a, a central kind of degenerate fiber. Um, so here you can see a little bit of the, the, the contractile fibers are disorganized here, but it's also being infiltrated by a large number of, of macrophages. So these are the, the body's cleanup mechanism. If you have um, bacteria or dead tissue, they're going to come in and chew it up. So that's what's happening in this case. Um, there's small numbers of eosinophils, which can be associated with muscle necrosis. Um, and rarely, maybe right there, maybe if you cross your eyes, there's a neutrophil. But for the most part, these are macrophages that are coming in to, to clean up. Again, this isn't myositis. This is cleanup. Um, and then this image is depicting the next stage, and this is regeneration. Um, so in the center of the field of view, there's this more kind of purple, basophilic or blue muscle fiber. Um, and then it has these large nuclei, and they're centrally located. Um, this is indicative of a regenerative muscle. So these are the satellite cells that have come together. They're stringing out to, to make a new fiber, and they're laying down more circle lemmal membrane um, and fibers. This is a normal fiber here, and then kind of scattered around our degenerate myofibers. So this right here is about five days um, post-insult. Um, so there's, there's evidence of, of regeneration. So those are the things that we would see. When you're out on the farm or potentially we're getting something in, um, put together some things that you should potentially be looking to collect. So first thing would be a feed and medication history so that you know what you're dealing with. Um, you'd want to collect, as Dr. Robbins said, multiple samples from the feeders in the, uh, in the barn. It, potentially, if we were submitted a whole carcass, in theory, we could grab um, stomach contents. But as Dr. Robbins said, many pigs aren't eating um, if they're exposed to, to ionophores. And so it may be low yield, as well as in literature, it's been shown that the amount in the stomach is often less than what's the as-fed. So there's a, potentially a dilutional aspect or something there. Um, you'd want to collect those fresh and formal and fixed tissues as well as potentially blood, depending on what you're um, dealing with. So pertinent questions that you should be asking from your uh, feed-related um, aspect would be, is, is there a new feed or did you open up a new bin? Um, the other questions you should ask would be, what's the source of this feed? Did this come from, um, you know, if you're within a system, is this a company-owned mill? Um, and if you know that it's a company-owned mill, you should be asking whether or not they have ionophores in the feed. Again, Narison is a swine-labeled um, ionophore in both the U.S. and Canada, so those would be pertinent questions to ask. If it's purchased feed, you want to know whether or not they're concurrently feeding um, cattle or poultry. Um, is the feed supposed to contain ionophores? So if it's from a system that you know is feeding schysis, you can't just say is it present or not. Um, you need to go a little further than that, so it would be good to know what it, what it's, if it's present or what level it's supposed to be, um, and then whether or not there's been any new um, um, medications have been introduced. So again, pleuromyrtilin, tiamulin is, is known. Um, there are other macrolide antibiotics that have been known to interfere with the liver um, enzyme. So P450 enzyme in the liver is what metabolizes both tiamulin and ionophores. And so if you have competition, you can have toxicity at what would otherwise be safe levels for both. Um, for feed, Again, grabbing those multiple samples. Um, Dr. Ramos just discussed the fact that you can have a, a quite, quite a wide range. So depending on how that's distributed within the feed will um, kind of differentiate if you get um, a, a, a correct sample. Um, and then again, if you're transitioning between bins, you may have more than one formulation in the barn. So if you happen to grab the wrong um, one and you only grab one sample, that could be problematic. Um, you want to submit that feed for a, a quantitative ionophore testing. Um, make sure you're checking with your lab to make sure that they're either they're doing it themselves or they're going to submit it to somebody that will do quantitative testing. Um, I'll go through some of the, the factors there. And then you also want to make sure that you're ruling out some of the nutritional type diseases, metabolic um, issues that you would want to be um, aware of as far as differential diagnoses. So how are, how are ionophores detected in feed? Um, 
usually they're not, they can be detected in tissues, but demonstration of toxic levels is hard because they have a short half-life and the concentration is usually pretty low in tissues. So we usually depend on your feed. Um, so it's done by liquid chromatography, um, and depending on where you're at, they may or may not be able to get to a, a quantitative uh, identification. So all of them should be able to get to a qualitative. They should be able to tell you which compound is present based on retention time in the column and what the ions that they're analyzing on the other end of the column look like. Um, and so the big question is, is what is the level there? Um, and so that involves um, having a standard curve for each particular compound, as well as being confident that you're able to extract everything that's in those feeds. So depending on your lab, they may or may not feel comfortable in giving you a number. So make sure you're checking that. Um, fresh samples, again, you're just going to be ruling out um, your, your pertinent differential diagnoses because clinically you may, it may not be a slam dunk. Um, and so grab everything there so you get the answer the first time. Um, so if it isn't an ion of toxicity, you'll have sent sufficient samples to, to get you an answer otherwise. So liver, that's just looking for other toxic organic compounds as well as checking kind of your mineral, mineral and vitamin analysis to make sure that you're not dealing with a metabolic bone disease or uh, potentially a, a myopathy, a nutritional myopathy. Um, you can send us limbs or joint swabs and we can check for an arthritis as a potential cause for your lameness if that's what your primary manifestation is. Um, if you're sending in a rib, we can get you an idea whether or not you're dealing with a metabolic bone disease if you have um, alterations in the, the density or potentially the mineral composition. Um, and then these would be ruling out your infectious causes, um, potentially meningitis or encephalomyelitis causing a, a primary neural um, reason for, for some of the signs as well as, um, so some pigs, whether it's because of the diaphragm or potentially the intercostal muscles will show respiratory, distra um, respiratory distress and so you'd want to make sure that you're not dealing with um, some sort of a pneumonia. And again, I put this in here, not everybody is going to pull blood, but you can use it in um, animals that don't necessarily meet euthanasia criteria, but you still want to know or potentially monitoring after. Um, so if you're dealing with a red urine, you'd want to make sure that you're not dealing with hemolysis. So you can check your pack cell volume to make sure that the red cells haven't been blown open. Um, you can check out your bilirubin to see whether or not it's been processing extra hemoglobin for some reason. Um, the main things for ionophores would be uh, checking to see whether or not you have elevations in a muscle-specific enzyme. So the creatine kinase um, is, is frequently astronomically high. Um, and then aspartase transferase, this, this AST is a, a, both a liver and a muscle enzyme. So there are isoenzymes that are associated with the muscle. So you need to interpret this result in light with your SDH or your, um, your other liver enzymes. Um, another interesting feature of um, muscle necrosis is it releases some of the intracellular components. So uh, potassium is a, is a predominantly an intracellular uh, electrolyte. Um, and so these pigs that are undergoing electro, um, skeletal muscle necrosis will often have sky high potassium. So these are some things that you can use as, as indirect markers in a, uh, an animal that you may not necessarily need to euthanize, but you want to monitor. Fixed tissues focus on skeletal muscle, um, so muscle groups are not equal. So ionophores tend to target the type 1 myofibers rather than type 2. So depending on which muscle you grab, you may or may not have um, striking signs. So I re recommend, based on what we've seen here, um, the diaphragm and the proximal esophagus show the most striking and repeatable um, lesions. You can also see lesions in the other muscle groups, so shoulder, ham, flank, and loin. If you can get intercostals, that would be good as well. Um, but just to show you, this panel right here is to, to give you an idea of the distribution of lesions within those muscle groups that we talked about. On the upper left, this is diaphragm. On the upper right is esophagus. So there's two layers to the esophagus. There's inner and outer. Um, and even within the esophagus, they're not equal. So this um, inner esophageal layer, muscular layer, is unaffected, and the outer is, is torn up. Um, but then in the other kind of, I just picked two characteristics. So in the ham, you still have some inflammation. And these pigs, that this, is, this was taken from the same pig, and this was about seven days, I believe, after um, kind of initial insult. And so this is a, a severely affected pig. But in the, in the ham, there's a, a small amount of in, inflammatory infiltrate coming to clean up. But in the loin, the only clue that you have that something happened is these small fibers, which are kind of clumped in the middle of, the, of the, um, the muscle bundle. And so depending on which sample you send us, we may or may not be able to, to slam dunk say this is, this is the problem. 
Um, again, pigs and, and the heart and ionophores are different than other animals. So I know the standard procedure is we send in ventricle, uh, maybe left papillary muscle. But if you're suspicious of ionophore toxicity, there is likely that there won't be any lesions in the heart muscle um, of the ventricle. So there um, were some nice studies done with monensin in multiple species. Pigs happened to be one of them by Van Vliet back in the 80s. And so it was discovered there that pigs will um, have intermittent atrial involvement, um, and it's, it's left more than right. And so if you want us to get a, a, skeletal, or a myocardial necrosis, you should send us atrium um, as well. We do want ventricle just so we can rule out some of the other nutritional myopathies. So again, these are just to rule out um, major differentials, which I've kind of run through quickly here. Again, so if you have lame or painful pigs, you'd want to make sure you're, you're thinking about your infectious arthritis. If you sent us your, your limb um, or potentially a joint swab, we've taken care of that. Metabolic bone disease, you've sent us the feed, you've sent us the liver. Um, we can rule things out as well as the, the rib. Um, if you have pigs that aren't able to get up, there are some differentials that you should potentially think about. So selenium toxicosis affects the motor neurons and the spinal cord. Often these pigs won't be painful, um, and they won't refuse feed. Um, so if it's, if it's a... a, a a feed contaminant that would potentially skew you away from this, um, or you know, meningitis or encephalomyelitis could potentially cause some of those um, inability to rise things. Respiratory distress, this one may be more of a, a herd level issue versus heart disease would potentially more than likely be an individual animal problem that you would be looking at. And then the, the feed refusal um, Dr. Robbins brought up has been um, discussed in, in many of the research papers as well. Uh, researchers have a hard time getting a uh, problem with inducing this because the pigs don't want to eat it. So they'll rake the, the feed out of the feeder, um, as we described in the clinical case. So um, feed contamination, but any sick pig is obviously going to be um, not eating as much. So based on what you see when you're posting the pig and what we see um, on, on histopathology, we should be thinking about a few different things. Um, so a nutritional type myopathy, a mulberry heart, could potentially cause skeletal muscle, but usually it's more heart focused, but it's something we should consider. If you're in a region where um, cottonseed is fed, gossipol has been known to cause the same lesion, but it's again, it's more heart focused. Um, and then of historical significance, but not necessarily um, in the population today, porcine stress syndrome causes the exact same um, um, lesions, and so it's not pathognomonic. Um, and then you should be um, aware that just because you have brown or red-brown red, red brown urine doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's myoglobin. So hopefully everybody feels a little more comfortable with what we're doing to diagnose it, samples you should collect, um, and, and the appropriate tests that, that need to be run.